let's start the next uh, presentation. Um, I'm going to be talking about persistent memory. I'm going to, this is going to be a slightly different uh, presentation than uh, some of the others that we've had in that um, I'm not talking about a new feature. Let me just get this, there we go. I'm not talking about a new feature. What I'm talking about is a high level uh, discussion that is intended to demystify this uh, new technology, which is going to be arriving very soon. Um, and the uh, idea here is to uh, demystify it, to sort of tell you what we, what is coming, what we can expect, and uh, sort of tell you what would happen if we tried to use it inside of a distributed storage system. Um, it may not be a good fit for a distributed storage system. That's okay. What I'm trying to do is answer the question is what would happen if you put it in there. I looked at it from three points of view. I looked at it from the standpoint of what we have to do to make the network faster, what we have to do to make the data path, that is number of CPU cycles per I.O., faster or shorter, um, and also if you use it piecemeal, that is if you take this highly uh, optimized storage technology and put it into the system, um, do you have to change your storage everywhere or can you just change uh, one part of it? And uh, that gets into tiering and caching, et cetera. So I'll talk a little bit about that. I originally did this at um, SNEA a few weeks ago. At that uh, time, I talked about um, uh, both Ceph and Gluster. Uh, for Gluster, I focused on the network. And for Ceph, I focused on CPU optimizations. So in this, this is an abridged version of that talk where I only talk about Gluster. Okay, so storage class memory. First, let's, let's talk about what this is. I'm using the term um, SCM or storage class memory. I'm, that, can, that is often used uh, in place of persistent memory. Um, I'll, those terms can be uh, interchanged with each other. Uh, uh, here's what we can expect. Here's what you can expect. Uh, it's not being sold yet. The principal part, the thing that everybody's waiting for is something called 3D X point that is going to come from Intel probably within the next year. Um, what will come will in high broad terms look something like this. It will be close to DRAM speeds. I'll be more exact on the next slide. Um, the wearability will not be like SSDs. In an SSD you can put it into your lab and you can create a loop and write to the same position on the SSD and if you come back a week later, that won't be usable any longer. That's true. That's not necessarily true with uh, persistent memory. The wearability characteristics, so Intel claims, we haven't been able to prove it ourselves, but we have talked to engineers there, are better. Um, and so a lot of the things that people do to avoid wearability with SSDs, we won't have to do necessarily with persistent memory. Um, there will be an API available to access this. Um, and so we can think about how we would access it from cluster. The API provides what are called crash-proof transactions. That is, if you, there is a system outage in the middle of writing to the persistent memory, you won't have half of it in the CPU cache and half of it written to the persistent memory. You will know whether it was written or not via this transaction. And you can do these accesses at either the byte or block level. Um, um, that's not necessarily something that is of any help to Gluster because we we go over we go through the file system, um, but it's something that is basically how storage class memory can work. So I'll mention that. Um, the cost structure of this will be akin to solid state disks in that. It will be a high cost in the beginning and go down over time. It will not necessarily be as expensive as DRAM, but it will be considered to be expensive. So uh, it's unlikely that people are going to go and replace all their storage with this when it uh, is available, just like you don't see people do that with SSDs today yet. Um, it will have fast random access, so it won't have the dichotomy that exists with disks where uh, sequential I.O. is way faster than in random I.O. That won't, and so people bend over backwards to get sequential I.O. patterns to run, to, to, get, to get whatever they want to do with the disk to go through a sequential I.O. pattern. 
uh, that won't be something uh, you'll necessarily have to do with persistent memory. So, so those uh, class of optimizations won't necessarily be needed. Um, uh, it has support in Linux, so you can go onto a Linux machine, Fedora, and you can actually reserve a chunk of memory and you can call that persistent. It's not, and then you cr that creates a, a slash dev slash pmem file, which then you can access as a block device. And that's how I did my experiments uh, over the summer with tiering, etc. Uh, in RDMA. Um, okay, so this doesn't exist yet, but it will soon. Um, however, what does exist today, which is really interesting, I think, is something called an NVDIM, which is basically DRAM with a battery backup built right into it. So you have, uh, you have a DRAM, and if there's a power outage, what will happen is all the data is copied off the RAM onto flash right there. And that gives us the same performance as uh, we would see with uh, uh, persistent memory. So that, that exists today. Okay, let's see if I can, okay, so here, this is an illustration of the problem, um, and you can see there's a, many magnitudes of difference between uh, a disk drive and what we expect or what is claimed will come with uh, storage class memory. It goes from 10 milliseconds down to less than one microsecond. Um, and then the other major components of the system, which are the network and uh, the data path, and which, which when I say data path, I mean the CPU, those, if you don't make them also fast, then they just simply become the bottleneck and you don't realize any of the benefits from this. So if you were to take today, and you can try this, you can just run Gluster over DRAM, a RAM disk, um, then you simply see the network or the CPU <coughs> becomes the bottleneck. And so the challenge for distributed storage is what to do about that, what to do about the latency on the rest of the system. It's really no big trick to make storage class memory work with Gluster. Uh, you can just put it underneath XFS, but um, how do you get the rest of the system's latency down? How do you push that down? And so that's, that's the challenge and that's the issue to solve. Okay, so when I gave this talk um, to, uh, at SNEA, I had to introduce something that we're all aware of, which is how we do replication, and uh, identify this as um, a major problem. And uh, where we have, since I came to uh, Red Hat, we've been moving gradually towards starting to use server-side replication, which um, uh, is also what Ceph uses, uh, or primary copy replication, where you, where you identify one node as sort of a leader, and you write your data to it, and it in turn will fan out, maybe in parallel, to replicate all the data to the other peers. This is different than client-side replication, and the significance here is that it introduces an extra hop. So, um, Ceph does this. Uh, are they, have, what have they done to, uh, uh, about the latency? Have, are they, have they done anything to, or can you do anything, is really the question. We've, we're introducing an extra hop when we go from client-side to server-side replication to, say, JBR. What can we do to shrink this? This is a big latency cost. Can we do anything about it? And the answer seems to be, as far as I can tell, is we're, we're stuck with it. Uh, though on the margins, uh, you can make some changes. For example, uh, you can have, uh, you can split the roles of writes and reads so that you can have one node for writes and then another node in the group, uh, the replication group for reads, which is, you could say, call it the tail, and say that the tail is the last node to receive all the replicas data. Therefore, it always has the uh, data that has been committed to, say, the quorum of uh, replicas, and therefore, those reads will do not need to be delayed if there's a write in front of it. Um, so say for Ceph, for example, you might have a, a write and then a read. Well, the read has to wait for that write to finish before it can uh, complete. It's a marginal thing, though. This is only helps a particular use case. And I, um, so this is uh, something I had to point out to people is, is when you go to uh, server-side replication, you're incurring that extra hop, of course, when we are using client-side replication, as we all know, um, we're eating up a lot of the client's uh, bandwidth, and that's the uh, converse trade-off. So we have to live within these, we have to live within that world. Um, 
wait, uh, we have to live within that world. Um, what can we do to, uh, since we really cannot do very much about the, the problem I just mentioned, um, can you add hardware uh, to um, improve the uh, matter? So a lot of the discussion in the persistent memory uh, community is about using RDMA, which is sort of an underutilized technology today, but perhaps will become more popular going forward. Um, RDMA's advantage is that it, are that you don't uh, involve the uh, copy the data to the kernel and have the kernel have to go through the kernel's uh, data path. You do it from application to application, and uh, hardware moves the data so the CPU is free to do other work. Um, so latency goes down for those those reasons. Um, uh, we have a good uh, RDMA interface in uh, Gluster. Uh, that is to say, we properly reserve the buffers ahead of time uh, for RDMA. We don't have to do that on a per I.O. basis. And our buffers don't need to be resized. They're uh, apparently big enough. And um, this is, uh, I've got some performance results on the next slide, which are, which, are, uh, which, are, which are nice. But then the question is, OK, so this technology exists, and you can purchase it, but is it good enough? Does it bring down the latency as low as it needs to be for storage cost memory? And interestingly, and this is where the fun part is, the answer is no. The RDMA latency is still um, about an order of magnitude off to what it would have to be uh, for the network not to be the bottleneck where you use, to use, uh, say, NVDIM. And so work is underway right now to improve the protocol, to make it even faster, and to reduce some of the overhead. Um, um, so what I see us doing here in uh, Red Hat, in uh, say Gluster and Ceph communities, is to uh, influence this and talk to uh, people who are um, working on this. And uh, an area, there's a few areas to look into. But for example, uh, currently when you write over RDMA, uh, when you receive an acknowledgement, it only means that it was written to the buffer on the server side. It doesn't mean that it was written persistently. So it simply means that it was delivered to the other side, but what if there's a crash at that point? Then you don't know that it was actually put there. Um, we would like to be able to have a commit bit, which basically says, when I send my last write in a sequence, then write the data persistently. And the acknowledgment that I get at the RDMA level, not the Gluster say stuff level, is, means that it was written persistently. Uh, so this would be a change in the protocol, but it's something that is being discussed and is something that, that uh, we can um, influence. And then another set of uh, uh, th uh, changes which are being suggested are atomic operations, sort of uh, uh, things like atomic increment and uh, uh, compare and swap. Um, and those, I think, could possibly help uh, Gluster and Ceph as well. So the changes you were uh, talking about, are these changes like in these uh the lowest level, yes. Okay. Lowest okay. level. Beneath, beneath, say, Samba, or for example, yeah, sure, sure. I mean, way down there, at the very bottom. So they would, might even require new hardware, I think, or firmware. Uh, yeah, okay, that must be yeah, new Mellanox cards. So um, this is, an, this is a, a thriving uh, area that's very current. Um, but what about today? Oh, yeah. Your question is, could we use a different file system than uh, XFS? Let's say XFS, uh, but in XFS for SSD. Well, let me, let me say, I mean, actually, it's similar to the password. I would say uh, it doesn't use the buffer cache. 
Yeah, just another uh, interesting point I, I learned at SNEA was, um, in, at least in Microsoft's case, when they stopped using their equivalent of the buffer cache, they saw no performance improvement. Um, uh, so what, when you use the buffer cache, say, you're writing to memory. When you skip it and just write to persistent memory, you're writing to something which is almost as fast as memory. Uh, these were early results. I don't think he had a conclusion. Um, I'm just passing on some uh, uh, some uh, information. Uh, I wanted to get some DAX results. I'll, probably the next time I uh, talk about this, I'll have it ready. Um, yeah. So DAX. Just to just to say it one more time. DAX sits underneath the file system and its job is to avoid using the buffer cache. So when you write to the file system, it'll go directly to persistent memory rather than through that intermediate yeah, so caching layer. Yeah. Um, one more side note. I'll try to quickly get through this. What Ceph did is uh, they stopped using a file system. Instead, they use a database. Um, now, they did that for two reasons, um, but there's a third benefit. Um, the two reasons that the did are things that we're well aware of. When you try to implement a transaction using POSIX, it's very difficult, and it makes it difficult to roll back or roll forward, roll forward or roll back. It's just difficult to implement. Um, and also, they did it because they had a, a journal, and they had for every write, it, there was basically a second write, once to the journal and a second time to the file system. So, they started to use a database in order to get rid of those two problems. The benefit, though, is that their latency is probably shortened by doing this. Um, I don't see us doing that in Gluster necessarily because we need a file system. Uh, we are a file system. Um, that might be a good birds of a feather session. Um, OK, so getting back to uh, RDMA, um, we uh, see uh, the classic Gluster results here. On the left are large data transfers, and on the right are small data transfers. I say classic because this is sort of a lot of what we talked about a lot about this morning. Small data transfers do poorly in Gluster. And uh, uh, what you have on the left are writes and reads. Um, on the left you have writes, and on these are writes and these are reads. The reads benefited greatly from RDMA. The writes, not so much. Um, when I spoke to um, uh, Rafi and others about this, I was told that was due to the replication overhead. On the right, we have uh, small transfers. And you can see RDMA did not help. Um, so what I have here is some sundry techniques which are very important for reducing latency. And um, uh, we've talked a, a few times about this already this morning, but uh, just reducing protocol traffic, chiefly lookups, is a giant, giant win uh, for Gluster. Um, coalescing protocol operations is, helps. Um, and then one I see that Ceph does, I'm not sure, I don't think it would be applicable to Gluster, is something called pipelining. And this is where you, when you, uh, when you have two back-to-back -back writes to the same object in itself, they'll um, start the replication of the first one. And then the second one can uh, be, doesn't have to wait for the first one to finish. It can be started uh, before uh, the second one finished. So they can run in uh, parallel. Um, OK, so. Um, Briefly, there are some, here are some techniques that you can use if you uh, likely cannot afford to put persistent memory uh, as a replacement for your storage. And you want to put it piecemeal into like a piece of your, uh, and accelerate your system uh, 
piecemeal. Um, so tiering is available in the kernel. Uh, the module's name is DM Cache. Um, it's uh, a little bit more mature than Ceph and Gluster's tiering, and so it's uh, probably got better performance in, in some cases. Um, its, its disadvantage is that it's only node aware. It doesn't know anything about the other nodes, so it can't make any decisions based on that. Um, Ceph tiering is uh, different than uh, Gluster tiering in that the pool sits in front of uh, the, the cache uh, itself, the accelerate, the SSD or persistent memory layer sits directly in front of the um, backend storage. So all IOs go to it. All IOs first go to this uh, cache, and it's it's only what spills over goes to the backing cache. Um, so uh, um, I'll spend a few slides talking about cluster tiering and network overhead. Um, since this is uh, an area that interests me greatly. Um, and uh, this slide basically just goes over what tiering is and how we implemented it. Um, I think the, the major lesson, since this is an audience that should know this, a lot of this already, the major lesson that I can share with you with, with our experience with using a database with tiering is that uh, the scalability isn't so good. Um, where the key to the database for a record is the GFID. That's because we want to be able to look up an individual file quickly. But when we want to get all the files which are uh, supposed to be promoted or demoted uh, in a given interval, we've got to do a full database scan, which is ON, and that's slow. It grows with the size of number of files which you're keeping in the database. Um, so that's not... Uh, even, even uh, well, I would say it's not a problem we've run into, and we've put, we've put tiers with a million files on it, and we've still not seen that to be uh, a major problem. Um, the full file scan, in other words, is, is manageable and something we can live with. But if I had to do things over again, I'd probably think twice. Um, okay. So, uh, network overhead. Network overhead in Gluster is a real severe problem. Um, and uh, we had a, a great uh, this talk this morning which explained uh, why that is. And there were pie charts. And they showed that the lookups are the reason for this. Um, I found this uh, over the summer because uh, someone opened up a bug and said, hey, small file performance is bad for tiering. This must be because tiering's broken. <laughs> well, it wasn't because tearing is broken. It was because Gluster's broken. So um, the problem was uh, the look. There's too many lookups, uh, and the the reason why are there so many lookups? Well, imagine. Uh, let's call this problem the full f path traversal problem. Let's say I want to uh, touch a path. Let's say I want to open a path. How do I know that each one of those directories exists and I have um, permission to touch it um, without ha checking each one? Uh, and this is what uh, I, it's a little unclear to me whether it's the VFS layer or the Fuse kernel module. But one of those two is doing exactly that and sending lookups for each level of uh, the directory for existence and permissions checks. Um, I'm going to skip this slide, but this is basically what DHT does when it reaches uh, the DHT layer. And the result is basically lookup amplification. And if you imagine, uh, say, a directory such as Ben England's in red, you get a blizzard of lookups. And it basically looks like uh, uh, the pie chart we saw this morning. The, the lookups dominate any benefit you get from faster transfers from tiering or storage class memory or RAM or whatever. This is uh, when you use uh, MD cache um, without having one second uh, timeout. So the blue <coughs> is before. This is with the small files. And the red is after. So if I cache everything on the client and I uh, don't, and if I use MD cache in its fullest, then 
the benefit is uh, enormous. You see, the number of lookups, which is the bottommost chart, go from here to here. This is the number of lookups we see over the network in that case. This is the performance gain that you get. In other words, we're as good as can be. We're, we're awesome. Gluster's performance is spectacular. Um, that's not just for cheering. That's for Gluster. So this is RDMA. Uh, the, uh, let's see. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so the blue here is um, the number of cache hits on the client, and the red is cache hits, yeah, on the client without MD cache. And then if you turn on MD cache, the red line is the number of cache hits. Um, these are the number of misses and cache hits. So these are cache hit, cache mit, miss counters on the client side cache. And this is the number of lookups. And here's the performance benefit with RDMA. Without MD cache and with MD cache. So we've just improved our MD cache performance dramatically as well. I think you'll see performance benefits everywhere. If we can just get this MD cache thing to work. Fair enough. I stand by the basic basic statement that if we do more client side caching, we will uh, help cluster a lot. Absolutely. Um, we may have to leave it there. Yeah. <laughs> Right, so I think I will leave it there. Um, <laughs> thanks, everyone. Yeah. All right, Jeff Darcy.